button here. Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Right. Is it down? You have down. I'll be short. I'll probably catch you up. Hello. Thank you for uh, attending this morning. My name is Lawrence Hutchings. Um, I'm from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We've been working for the last uh, four years, I think, uh, with the Obama stimulation money to look at enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, my colleagues for this are Ankit Singh. Uh, he's a student from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, a seismologist. Brian Bonner is a um, rock physicist. I'm talking a fair amount about rock physics. And Steve Jarpy is an instrumentation person. Part of our uh, objective here was to develop a means where we could quickly, rapidly, and cheaply uh, identify geothermal systems. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at uh, the ability to model, monitor, and track a development of an enhanced geothermal system in hot crystalline rock. So in a sense, it's kind of a old school complement to the previous talk. So we'll see if we, how we progress with approaching the, um, the uh, traditional way of looking at hot, dry rock. So how do I change? Uh, um, okay. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, 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 and I realize this is not a seismological session, so I'm going to try to define terms more clearly. But um, in our interpretation, we're going to uh, derive uh, models, three-dimensional models of the, of the velocity of the P waves, velocity of S waves, uh, with a Q of P and S. Q in our world is the uh, reciprocal of attenuation, it's the seismological quality factor. So unfortunately, a high Q is low attenuation, and a low Q is um, high attenuation. So it's kind of reciprocal. What we're trying to do in our interpretation of, of reservoir properties, and we're basing this on interpretation of microearthquake data, and I'll explain more of this later. Uh, we're trying to develop quantitative relationships between reservoir properties and seismic data. Our data are at the surface, and our properties that we're trying to resolve are maybe three kilometers deep. So that's kind of the challenge we're facing. Uh, in our interpretation, we're looking at uh, relationships that have been developed for rock physics in laboratories, laboratory studies, and we're looking at uh, field log data that we know exists and relating that to what we observe at the surface in microearthquake recordings. And then in the process of this, we're trying to develop models of the reservoir using the rock physics to get a, a description of the state of fractures, fluids, and permeable zones. This is our objective. Very uh, important to all of this is 3D visualization. It's so complicated. There's so many pieces of information. And it's such a three-dimensional volume um, that you re you, a human really can't interpret it without getting a good, good uh, Visualization. I see Jeff Wagner in the audience who has developed this method for 25 years and he's been really instrumental. But unfortunately, we didn't use Earth Vision. We used Visit for this. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, what we have, what we developed here is a little study area. It's six by six kilometers approximately. And um, we put in a, a high density number of recording stations. That's high density in seismological world. Traditionally, you might have five instruments in this area to record, uh, record your data. But we, um, we realized you can't get high resolution with five instruments. So we, we're trying to up the numbers of instruments. But the instruments typically have cost 20 to 30, 40,000 dollars each, which is really prohibitive uh, detailed studies. So we actually, along with this project, uh, backtracked and developed a whole new instrumentation package. Then we got the cost down to 1,000 dollars. And we've proven that it's of equal quality, but I'll get into that later. So we have the study area here with high density number of stations. These are all different uh, names, but aren't really important here, just the locations are. Our test is in the middle, which I'll talk about. And to get you oriented, here's the Bay Area. The geysers is up here, our study area is right in here. So this is the geothermal uh, uh, development area for the geysers we've all heard about, I think, many times. Okay, you can change that. So here's the, the geysers geothermal study area here. This is about 20 kilometers by 10. And we're here up in this little area up in here. 
It's called the Prodi 32 injection test. The idea was to inject cold water into a hot component, crystalline rock, and um, develop a permeable pathway to a second well to create an enhanced geothermal system. So it's kind of the test. If you inject in, the, in California a highly pre-stressed uh, rock from tectonic plate motions, you inject cold water into that, you get a lot of earthquakes. And uh, the other uh, thing I want to point out is that um, the traditional zone of development for the, the geysers area has been up here, uh, 240 degrees C uh, temperature and above, and is more permeable and um, more accessible and actually has a lot of fractures and fluids through it already that you can develop uh, conduits for, for, for uh, energy, uh, energy development. Below that, we call the high temperature zone, has been very competent uh, uh, crystalline rock, very hot, in other words, hot dry rock. And so this well was drilled, drilled into the hot dry rock, so it was pristine uh, development. And then cold water was injected, and these are earthquakes that ensued after that. Primary cause of the earthquake is either thermal contraction or a pressure release on pre-stressed fractures. And we're not exactly sure which uh, is occurring, and that's part of what we can determine from our analysis. If you look at the whole geyser development area, these are all earthquakes. There's thousands and hundreds of thousands of earthquakes create, created by just uh, production of geothermal energy. There previously had not been earthquakes in this part of the field in the deep, uh, hot, uh, dry zone. So I can tell you, I can answer your questions in your mind already. If you go to other parts of the world where there's no earthquakes, this doesn't work, okay? So we got that part. So let's go to the next one. This is our instrumentation we developed. I'm not going to go into this at, very, at length, but um, it enables us to rapidly, quickly install uh, seismic instruments in a field and to um, gather data automatically in high density uh, uh, rates, which creates a lot of data. That's kind of the problem for uh, seismology is having too much data. But um, we're, we're actually looking towards the oil industry, which is way ahead of the geothermal energy and processing and collecting data. And I think that uh, we're trying to catch up a little bit with that. OK, go to the next one. I'm going I'm to skip this. There's nobody here probably interested in the recording system details, but they can talk to me afterwards if they are. But uh, the other thing is when you, rec when you collect all this data as with the oil industry, you have to find ways of processing it and not the traditional way that we've done in seismology where you give it to a grad student and two years later he comes up with a model. We're trying to automate the whole process from putting the f uh, instrumentation in the field, which we've simplified to where it can be easily put in the field and quickly with a lot of instruments. And then out of that we get a lot of data. We've automated the whole processing system so that we get it flows through our computer program, which I'll talk about in a, a couple slides forward, to get it fairly automatic, automatically flowing, so where we get images of our volume, which I'll talk about how we do that, locations of our earthquakes in virtually real time. As the data comes in, it goes through our system, comes out with the uh, results of the, uh, that we're looking for, which is images of what we think is the volume that we're studying. I'm not going to go into all these either, but just to catch you up on a little bit what I'm going to be talking about when I start talking about interpretation. Uh, we've, got, we've culled through the literature of rock physics and worked with our rock physicists, and much to his chagrin, I'm trying to boil it down to fairly simple uh, quantities that we can work with in interpretation in the field. And of course, uh, every field is unique, so there's some, certain things that vary, but in general terms, We've, uh, we've looked at some general properties of rock physics. We try to boil down to where we can make fairly quick interpretations. Uh, some of the things that um, I will be talking about that I, I want to point out now, for example, when we talk about attenuation of seismic energy, we're talking about propagation of seismic waves through a medium. And in that propagation process, the loss of energy, which is the attenuation, can be due to what we call intrinsic which is uh, the forcing of fluids to pass back and forth through, uh, through, uh, through, through permeable uh, material, and extrinsic, which is uh, which energy lost by reflecting and refracting off small fractures as it propagates through, so a, uh, through a, a medium. So there's intrinsic and extrinsic Q. Well, they're each sensitive to different things. One's sensitive to fracturing, the other one's sensitive to, uh, to porosity and, and, uh, and fluids. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And our, our seismic velocities, we have the P wave velocity, 
which is, uh, if you look at it in your mind, in the equation, we have the shear modulus and a term called lambda I'll be talking about divided by the density. And our shear wave velocity, which is the shear modulus by itself divided by density. And whereas the shear modulus is not sensitive to fluids, it's zero, virtually zero uh, rigidity for fluids. So the shear waves don't see fluids, whereas the P waves do. So this behavior of how P waves behave in a medium versus how shear waves behave in a medium can tell you a lot about what's going on in the medium. Similarly, as you look at your uh, attenuation properties, and you can contrast all these, you begin to get a picture of what's happening, and that's what we will be doing in the next couple of three slides. But I also want to point out, those are, uh, in effect, direct parameters of our interpretation. We can derive parameters as well, and what we get out of that, we get Poisson's ratio, for example. We can get that out of the, uh, of the velocities of the PNS waves. We can get bulk modulus and lambda and um, Young's module. So we get some elastic parameters out. They themselves tell you things about the properties of the reservoir. So we play really eight parameters of the uh, elastic properties that we record at the surface uh, versus our tomographic images of what's in the volume to try to interpret what's going on. You can next slide. We also get um, interpretations of the earthquakes themselves. You have the locations of the earthquakes and what we call the moment tensor of the earthquakes. This is a very important parameter because it, it tells you how the fractures occurred. It, you know, if you plot what is traditionally called a Hudson plot in seismology, and where you plot on this plot can tell you if you're a, a, a crack opening or a crack closing. You can tell if you're uh, an explosion. You can tell if you're a double couple. By the way, the earthquake actually slips, and our, and our recordings of information from that can give us an uh, interpretation of how the, what type of fractures we're getting when we create these fractures. And here, we actually plot the uncertainty in this. For example, this is the high likelihood position of this one particular earthquake. So it has an uncertainty, and we're trying to capture that uncertainty. But this is not an explosion. It's not a strike slip. This is actually a crack opening uh, or a isotropic uh, motion, which is uh, what you would want to create permeability. OK, next slide. Now, we also try to enhance our tomographic codes. Our codes, what they took in tom tomography, we're recording up here at the surface, and we have earthquakes down here at depth, and we're trying to project, uh, as those propagate through the volume, trying to back project to, to interpret properties of the volume. Um, so that's our tomography. But as I said earlier, it's, you're three kilometers down here, and you're trying to, rec you know, you're recording up here. So you have a lot of difficulty with accuracy or resolution of your data. We've uh, modified our codes to take advantage of uh, situations where earthquakes more or less align so that they have a common ray path to the station, and we reduce the uh, tomography to, between, to be between events. So then, down in here, where we're really interested in what's going on, we're looking at the tomography uh, down. We've, in effect, removed our stations down to here to be down at depth, so we get a higher resolution down at depth uh, between earthquakes versus all this common travel path, which we're really not that interested in, which is negated by having them travel the same path, and that's not the part we're particularly interested in. So we call this a common ray tomography, which we've developed, and we'll still look at some of that. Oh, I want to point out here, right here, this is the Prodi 32 uh, injection well right here. Um, and uh, these are two other injection wells in the area. This is Prodi 9. Our, um, and you can see here, this is an old well that's been projecting for years, and the earthquakes are well below the well here. And I, unfortunately, one of our postdocs did study this early on. We said, look, at your earthquakes are really mislocated because it, you should be right occurring where at the bottom of the well where the water is released. But uh, when, we read, when we did this study, we started, and I'll show later, uh, the earthquakes at other wells are occurring around the wells. Here, right here is the last 500 meters of the well. And that's when the ejection uh, occurred, the water was released at the last 500 meters. Uh, as I said, this was pristine, nothing had been ejected here before. So we knew it precisely when things were occurring and where they were occurring, and we felt this was a really good test validation of our computer codes for monitoring uh, well development. And uh, right here in red are the first uh, six events that occurred. 
So the fact that they occurred next to the well and right within the 500 meter span where uh, the water was released have given us confidence that we're locating the earthquakes correctly. And if you're locating the earthquakes correctly, you're also getting the tom tomographic images of the volume, which is just different colors for different uh, uh, attributes, uh, uh, correct. So that, that's one thing I wanted to point out. How much time do I have? Okay, and next slide. Okay, this is it, no. Okay, so here are some tomographic images now that we've produced uh, for this uh, volume. And like I said, there's eight parameters. I'm not going to show all eight parameters, I've, although I've discussed some of them. But here, for example, the bulk modulus, you can see that right out of the well, where the water is released, we get a really high increase in bulk modulus and fairly well-defined little uh, area. This is right after the wells, one month af uh, after one month of injection, one month of water being injected, you begin to see this uh, little anomaly begin to show up right at the bottom of the well. Well, first off, that's another validation of the accuracy of our uh, tomographic images. It's, not, it's coming out of the well, it's not somewhere else. It's right along where the water was released. So we have confidence that we're accurately identifying where it's occurring. And uh, we think we're accurately getting the results of what's, what's occurring. So in this case, we had a high bulk modulus. This is the shear, the shear wave velocity. So the velocity of shear waves also protruding out from the well. The shear wave velocity went down. Now, remember, water is it's not, it's not a really affected by um, the, the shear modulus. The shear velocity is the shear modulus divided by density. So if you increase the density with fluids, you would lower the shear, the, the, the shear uh, velocity. So it could be a density increase causing it to go down. It also could be a fractures. If you have fractures, you're going to reduce the shear modulus. So uh, one thing to keep in mind, by itself, it's not telling you what's going on here. It could be a saturation with a higher density, or it could be reduction of the shear modulus uh, due to fracturing. But in any case, we're seeing a, a reduction of the shear wave velocity right around the uh, bottom of the well. Poisson's ratio is a, a, a term which is a very similar, uh, it's very often used to indicate the existence of fluids. Uh, a high Poisson's ratio usually is indication of existence of fluid, and here we have very high, uh, high um, Poisson's ratio. Uh, bulk modulus also is, tends to be an indication of fluids because bulk modulus is re uh, increasing means that you're getting a harder surface, a harder volume to compress, basically. And lambda in laboratory tests has shown that when it's high, it's also an uh, indication of saturation. So our first conclusion is that the fluids are being injected in very hot material. We're talking about uh, almost uh, 300, over 300 C, but it's not turning to steam. It's staying as fluid. It's staying as, as liquid. And it's, it's not uh, evaporating into uh, steam immediately anyway. So you go to the next slide. So this is what we interpreted from the previous slide. The bulk modulus of Poisson's ratio and lambda increase indicate that there's uh, full fluid saturation around the well bottom. Lambda especially is very sensitive to full saturation. It's actually fairly stable until it gets near full saturation and then jumps up to very high values. So that's a good indication of full, uh, full, uh, full saturation. We also saw uh, attenuation properties, which I didn't show you slides for, but uh, there's a decrease in the VS, which I talked about. There's also a decrease in the, in the Q. So, a, a low Q means high attenuation. And so that, uh, like I said earlier, an increased fracturing decreases um, a Q from intrinsic properties, I mean from extrinsic properties, and that's uh, fractures. Uh, and also, um, saturation will offset this more in QP, which is the, uh, the, the P wave attenuation. So what we saw was that QP increase and QS decrease. So we interpret this to be full saturation and partial saturation would decrease intrinsic Q and full saturation would increase, I'm sorry, intrinsic Q. It should be extrinsic Q. Okay, anyway, these are the kind of games we play. So let's go to the next one. So now we've got the second month after injection. We're still monitoring this. We're looking at the second month after injection. What's happened here is that um, the P wave velocity here, which is very similar to the bulk modulus, uh, had a high P wave velocity which disappeared. But below the well, a new anomaly has shown up where the velocity of the P waves has dropped. 
So we think that there's something going on here that's kind of transformed this above it. And now it's been already been fractured, we think, because you have all these earthquakes there. But no longer is the fluid there. It may have evaporated into steam. But now down here, we have a low velocity of P waves. And here, we continue with a, uh, a low uh, shear wave velocity, but it's increased in size. So it's expanded in its volume there where it's occurring. Lambda has remained high, which is an indication of saturation. And the bulk modulus has almost gone away. Okay, it's a little low here, which you, won't, you can't really see, but, uh, which corresponds to the low P, but it's a little low here. But basically, the high, remember before, we had a really high bulk modulus up here. That's returned back to normal, in effect. Okay. So the bulk modulus and VP have returned to values comparable to before injection for the volume around the well. That's the first part of the first uh, 500 meters. It really it looks like it's almost normal in the tomography. This suggests fracturing and saturation balance because we know there's fracturing there and there still has to be some saturation, otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, get the, the balance in the, P wave in the P wave velocities to look normal. And so we think that there's, uh, so, so there, there's some steam, or some steam forming because the saturation is decreasing. The VS continues to be low and lambda and Poisson's ratio continue to be high compared to before injection. So this changes have not moved, but increased in size. So that's what we already had before. A new, a new anomaly with low VP and no change in VS has emerged below the well, suggesting only a change due to a reduction in lambda. OK, go ahead. So anyway, so a point is that that's what we uh, uh, have worked on to try to find ways to interpret what the field is doing and interpret where this is occurring, when it's occurring so that we can monitor these kinds of injection tests. And we thought the Pride 32 was a good uh, test because, as I said, we knew when things were happening and where things were happening. And so it gives a good ch uh, chance to validate our codes. So we think that improved data collection and processing can reduce reservoir mo monitoring and modeling costs and increase resolution. I think we can show that microearthquake data can be used to provide a basis uh, for rock physics interpretations of reservoir properties. And the Prodigy uh, 32 injection, hot competent rock produced fracturing and saturation that can be observed in microearthquake analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one question. What are the temperature and pressure of each what? Each of what? Of the injected water. Oh, it's, a, uh, it's just um, atmospheric temperatures and it gra only injected under gravity. So it's, it's actually just surface water poured down the well. Thank you. <laughs>